sound check, sound check. Can someone give me a thumbs up if they can hear me using the chat window? Thank you, Ted. Folks, the seminar will start in about three minutes. Thank you.
All right, we've reached uh, 50 attendees, so uh, let's get started. A very warm welcome to all of you. Um, I see that um, there's a lot of you that have logged in, so the story of what I'm about to tell you must resonate with you. My name's Neil Bala. I'm um, this guy up here. Let me get a, um, a highlighter here. A highlighter, there we go. My name's Neil Bala. I'm this uh, gentleman up here. And uh, this is John Mark, my partner, who uh, couldn't be here today because he's on his summer vacation in France. This particular topic is one that I've been thinking about for a long time, and I've been afraid of presenting um, this topic simply because it's such a difficult and controversial topic. But uh, when Brexit happened, I really felt that I had to put a, a seminar together on this. So I'm, I'm very happy to present this event to you. Um, let's start with our goal. We have a lot to cover, so I'm going to quickly go through our goal. I'm going to ask you this question. What really drives the price of stocks, bonds, and real estate today? And I'm going to give you some answers that may seem very counterintuitive. In part one of our presentation, we're going to talk about a world drowning in de debt. In part two, we're going to talk about bizarre interest rates and their e the impact on the economy, especially on the United States economy. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Brexit, this odd thing that happened in Europe where Britain seceded from the European Union. Maybe this is the straw that breaks the camel's back. Who knows? Then in part three, I'm going to talk about what this means for average Joe American investor. How do you tie together all these huge things that are going on in the world economy, amazing, unprecedented things that are going on, and tie it back to what you're doing today in real estate? So we'll talk about those scenarios, and I'll give you three of them and how they affect real estate. I'll give you the Federal Reserve scenario, the in-between scenario, and then the recession scenario, and we'll talk about the impact that that could have on real estate. And then we'll take questions and answers. And by the way, when it comes to questions and answers, as a presenter, I actually like people asking questions as they go along. So don't wait until the end. Don't write down your questions. Whenever you feel like, just use the chat box and send me a question. And on my side, there's a little blinking icon. It might take me a second to see it, but as soon as I see it, I'll look at your question and answer it if it's relevant. Um, also, for those, the, the most common question I get is, do we ever get a copy of this PowerPoint? The answer is, yes, you do. When you finish the webinar, I'll be sending out a copy of the PowerPoint. Now, in case you want a copy of the actual presentation, the video recording, when I send you the email about the PowerPoint, send me an email back asking for the video, and I'll send that over to you. Lastly, if, if for any reason I get disconnected, um, you know, audio disconnect or, or something like that, please let me know, and um, uh, I, will, um, uh, I will respond back. And yes, Yama, I do see your questions, absolutely. Um, let's see. Okay, let's get started. So let's start with what is unquestionably the most boring but important part of my um, presentation, and that is the disclaimer. So... We're not investment advisors, and this webinar is provided for educational purposes only. We're also not forecasters and are just sharing our own opinions. All investments involve different degrees of risk. You should be aware of your risk tolerance level and financial situations at all times. I promise I'm not going to go this quickly through the presentation, but let's, let's read through this. I'll read all investment docs carefully before making any decisions. All information should be researched prior to investing any money. You're free to accept or reject all investment recommendations made by us. All services that we offer are subject to market risk and may result in loss to your investment. As you know, recommendation is not a guarantee for the successful performance of an investment. and We cannot guarantee against losses arising from market conditions. Do not invest your money on our recommendation alone. Consult a professional advisor. There. Mr. Lawyer, I said what you asked me to say. Now can I get on with the webinar? All right. I have another question. All right. Let's keep going. So about the presenters, uh, this, this webinar is really not about us or what our company does, so, but we'll give you a very brief overview. My partner, John Mark, and I run Financial Attunement, which is a real estate investment company, and we are passionate about having your assets work for you, fine-tuning your thinking about capital investing, and really that's what I'm doing today, fine-tuning that thinking, hence the name of our company, Financial Attunement. We buy and manage large multifamily complexes nationwide in California, Texas, Oklahoma, um, North Carolina, and Illinois. And we have a deep competency in asset selection management. As part of our work, we look at what's going on in the marketplace because it affects us it, and affects us very closely and constantly, hence this webinar. So 
Before I start, uh, the good news and the bad news. So there's this very popular quote from Violet Fane, good things come to those who wait. Over the next hour, I'm going to say a lot of stuff that sounds like bad news. Well, it is bad news, but there's a silver lining for real estate investors. So please wait for the silver lining near the end of the story. Good things come to those who wait. So here's my first question. What really drives the price of real estate and stocks today, right? Is it the Republicans? Is it these Democrats? Is it their policies? Is it the economy? Is it jobs? Is it the lack of new construction in real estate? What if all of these were smaller factors? And what if for a moment you were willing to assume that there was an 800 pound gorilla in the room, a huge 800 pound gorilla? And what if since 2001, the price of real estate and stocks is being driven by shadowy characters who run the world's central banks, by people who, in the immortal words of Obi-Wan Kenobi, have become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. I can tell you that every one of the hundred odd people that is connected right now can identify all four of the politicians on the last page. But I doubt that there's even one person today that can identify all five of these characters. These three guys are probably easy because they're American. Well, this is Mario Draghi, who is basically the chairman of the European Central Bank. And this guy, who is a very important player in our story today, is Kuroda. I can't even remember his first name. But he, this guy, in sitting somewhere in Japan, is impacting your interest rates in your bank, in impacting the cap rate of the real estate that you buy, impacting even the price of the groceries that you buy. This guy. Because he's playing the most reckless and most dangerous monetary experiment in history. In fact, all of them are. So here's an even more grand statement. What if since 2008, since the great financial crisis, GFC, the in how the entire world economy performs actually depends on what the central bankers do? Is it possible that our civil servants have actually become our masters? That's my second grand statement. And if you think that I'm exaggerating, check out the sheer hubris, the sheer arrogance of this quote. There is no other agency of government that can overrule actions that we take. A public statement from St. Alan Greenspan, past Fed chairman. So how do we get the answers to these grand questions that I'm asking, right? The answers come in our story. This is a story that's going to tie back into real estate and the investors and pros in this virtual room. I have a question. Okay. All right. So Ted Siegel. Wow. The, so fine. What's interesting is I do have an investor, Ted Siegel, who could name all five of them. Good for you, Ted. You, you definitely keep up with real estate. All right. Back to our story. The first part of the story is not about any of these central bankers. It's really about debt. Simply way too much debt. And 2008 was the start of this story. The years since have been the denial years, and the years to come will be the final resolution that I believe a thousand books are going to be written about. So time to get started with our story. Let's start with the debt. Crushing, suffocating, growth-killing debt. Here's part one. The world is drowning in debt that we cannot pay back. According to McKinsey Institute study, in just seven years, since Q4 2007 to Q2 2014, the world added 57 trillion, that's 57,000 billion dollars of crushing debt. While households actually did a fairly decent job of controlling their debt down here from 37 to 45, the governments went a little insane. They went all in on the debt party, increasing their gigantic debt, and they're up here in the green, from 33 trillion to 58 trillion, that's 9% a year compounded. They almost double their worldwide debt in just seven years. And the last two years have been even worse than that. So already they were going a little insane from 2000 to 2007, a 50% increase, and now accelerating to more like a 70 or 80% increase in just seven years. 9% compounded with economies that are not growing beyond two or 3%. Something insane is happening here. So let's start with uh, the usual suspects, right, and, and study them a little bit. Let's start with Uncle Sam. And we all know that we're the most global, powerful, incredible, fabulous country in the history of the world. 
at Houston, we have a problem, and it's a rather big one. The United States now has its debt that is higher than our total gross domestic product, which is the total sum total of what we produce. We've now got debt higher than that. And our debt this year will be $600 billion. And the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, pr predicts that if we have a 2017 recession, the deficit, the, the, the gap will hit a stunning $1.3 trillion a year. Now, what I'm about to say is even more stunning. The absurd good news is we are so much better off than everyone else that our staggering debt load may not even matter right now. It may not even matter. And why? Well, that's because of everyone else in the world. Let's get started with the rest of the world. We start with China, that awesome growth engine of the world, this amazing economy that everyone talks about. Well, it turns out that the Chinese have built a new great wall, a great wall of debt. It appears that their marvelous growth engine was actually fueled about by the greatest orgy of debt in the history of the world. In just seven years, the Chinese have gone from $7 trillion in total debt to $28 trillion in total debt. And keep in mind, this is an economy smaller than the United States. That's an amazing number. And this, this number comes from the good folks at Real Vision TV who have given us a lot of these statistics. So China, and you, you see some of the, the impacts of this crazy growth here. You see the real estate market cratering. But here's a statement from John Malden that always stuns me every time I read this. So read this statement. Depending on who you want to listen to, 30 to 80% of the last $6 trillion that the Chinese borrowed went to pay interest on the debt that they already had. 30 to 8% of what they're borrowing is just paying interest. In less polite circles, we would call that a Ponzi scheme. This isn't a Ponzi scheme for $50 billion with a guy named Madoff. This is a Ponzi scheme of $28 trillion, trillion dollars. The entire Chinese economy could possibly be a Ponzi scheme. I'm not saying it is, but it's starting to look more and more like that. What about emerging markets like uh, BRICS? And BRICS stands for uh, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, who have already covered and South Africa, right? So these countries, how are they doing? Maybe they're, maybe they're controlling their debt much better. Well, as it turns out, they'll be damned if they're going to be let behind. These countries have trumped everyone else by increasing their total debt in 10 years, since 2005, when they were at 5 trillion, to now, when they're at 25 trillion in just 11 years. 500,000, 500% increase in debt in just 11 years. That's an orgy if I ever saw one. And then finally, the greatest one of them all, Japan, the economy that most people say is a bug looking for a windshield. So Japan, Fortune magazine says, is the world's real economic time bomb. And I agree with that statement. This isn't some other magazine. This is Fortune magazine. Forget Greece. Japan is the world's real economic time bomb. So the Japanese have a G debt to GDP ratio that's unmatched in the world. For every buck that their economy is worth, they owe $2.29. That's just insane. But that's just the beginning of their problems. They have a shrinking population, they have an aging workforce, and they have very, very deep-rooted anti-immigration attitudes, which means that their, their population will continue to shrink. And so to fix this, the Japanese have come up with something truly awesome. They call it Abenomics. It is the grandest and most reckless monetary experiment in history. Simply put, it is about massive increases in government spending and massive increases in stimulus or money printing, all designed to create what is known as inflation in the economy, right? So isn't this a lot like what we did in 2008? Yeah, we, we did lots of government spending and we did lots of money printing. Yes, but the Japanese are doing it three times larger not 30% larger than what we did, three times larger. So here's how it works. The government goes deeper and deeper and deeper into debt because they're spending money that they don't have. And the Japanese central bank prints a lot of money out of thin air and they buy up all of the government's debt. So the money basically transfers hands. And the Japanese central bank buys the debt so aggressively 
that regular Joe investors like pension funds who have legal obligations to hold um, government bonds have to pay negative interest rates to lend money to the government for 10 years. Negative interest rates to lend money to the government for 10 years. So they spend more and they print more and their interest rates have dropped below zero. Yep, that's how insane Japan is. So, is this Abenomics thing actually working? Well, the yen dropped by 57% against the US dollar in the last three years of Abenomics. That's a stunning loss of purchasing power. If I was Japanese, I'd be really unhappy about that 57%. What about growth? Well, they've had two recessions in the last four years. Well, what about the all-important inflation? I'll take a look at the right. Does this look like they're managing to actually create inflation? It's dropped below zero. An economy in deflation. Well, clearly, it isn't working the, the way that they designed. But what are they doing? They're doubling, they're going double. So now they're increasing the amount of money that they're throwing in there. So something a little crazy. So crazy that Japan reminds me of an important quote from the smartest man in history. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Let me take a question. Um, so, uh, Yama, it's a, it's a very good question, but I think it's, it's, it's not necessarily relevant to the topic, so I, I might answer this one at the, at the very end. So we'll keep going. So if you're a creditor watching this madness going on, right, you're, you're somebody that's lending money, what do you do? You know, if you're rational and careful, you decide that lending to these countries is, is risky, right? Well, so what should you as a lender do? Should to reduce your risks, you, you would probably want to increase your interest rates, right? And to account for all that risk. Or maybe you want to just stop lending to these countries altogether. Well, let's see what happens to interest rates in part two of our story. And by the way, for those that are really into real estate, watch for connections as to why sky, real estate prices are skyrocketing worldwide. This isn't a U.S. phenomenon. It's happening worldwide. You'll see lots and lots of clues in part two of our story. Let me take a look at another question here. Uh, okay, let's keep going. Let's see. Part two, the interest rates. So, unfortunately, insanity prevails yet again. Interest rates worldwide for government bonds have been crashing. They're going down, they're going down, and they're continuously going down in 2016. In Switzerland, now you can buy, when you buy a government bond, you actually pay the government so that they can have your money for 10 years. In fact, it looks like Switzerland now, even the 20-year bond is negative. Japan, even though in this graph it shows 8-year negative, it actually, the 10-year Japanese bond is now negative. Germany has now gone 10 year negative. And you, you think that Germany and Japan and Switzerland are some great countries, and I agree, right? But you notice that right here, down here, Italy and Spain are negative interest rates, right? And we'll talk a little bit about those countries. So in June, something bizarre happened. Bonds from companies, private profit-making corporations, are now at zero yield. So if you're Sanofi, which is a big European company, or Unilever, another big European company, you can now borrow money from the market for free, for free, with no interest. That's what this mad orgy of debt has done. Do you think that if you were a public company and you could borrow money at free, you may be a little um, less than prudent with what you did with this completely interest-free money? Think about that. So let's cover the, some of the, the, the really crazy countries. Let's, let's leave Switzerland and Germany alone, right? So let's look at Italy. Italy can borrow for 10 years at 1.2%. They haven't been able to borrow at around 1.2% for 209 years. 209 years. Italian banks have $400 billion, $400 billion of bad loan. As a percentage of their economy, this is worse than the great financial crisis in the U.S. in 2008. It's worse. But who cares? They can borrow at 1%, so let's keep the debt party going. Let's look at Spain. Spain can borrow for 10 years, for, again, for around 1.2%, which is a 194-year low. 
Before Spain joined the EU, the European Union, their bonds yielded 14%, and that's not very long ago. The Spaniards, their unemployment rate is at a stunning 22%, which is crazy until you realize that it's the best number they've had in four years. But hey, they can borrow at 1%, so let's keep the debt party going. So the rate of negative government bonds is increasing, and it's increasing at an almost unbelievable rate. It's really difficult to comprehend the rate at which negative government bond supply is increasing. In 2014, there were almost no negative yield government bonds. Basically, any government in the world that wanted to borrow money for you had to pay for it, right? You had to pay for the privilege of borrowing money. In 2016, in February, $3.6 trillion worth of bonds worldwide were negative, right? you were paying these governments so that they could take your money. In February 2016, one year later, the number doubled to seven trillion. In July 2016, five months later, it went from seven to trillion. This time, it's almost doubled in five months. And what's scariest is that in the last two weeks, it's up by $1.3 trillion. Two weeks the world has bought a trillion dollars of negative government debt. So I think it's high time to coin a new term. And please remember, you heard it here first. Subprime governments. Subprime governments. Possibly the largest and fastest growing bubble in history. And that bubble is affecting everything you do in real estate. It's affecting the buying price. It's affecting the selling price. It's affecting the yield. It's affecting what your investors expect, all because a bunch of governments is going subprime. But then the United States is strongly against going negative on interest rates, right? So at least our politicians are not as insane as the rest of the people, right? What does Janet Yellen think? If it was possible to take rates into negative territory, I would be voting for that. Janet Yellen current chairwoman of the United States Federal Reserve. Here's a very good question from Yevgeny. I was hoping somebody would ask this question. Why do people lend money at negative rates? So, you know, it doesn't make any sense, right? Why would you want to take money from your bank and lend it? So, number one, people lend money at negative rates because they are legally required to hold a certain percentage of government bonds in their portfolio. If you're a large... Um, large uh, hedge fund, if you're a pension fund, if you're huge, you know, you, you manage billions or even hundreds of billions of dollars, there are legal requirements that a certain percentage of your bond portfolio be treasuries of your country, right? And those legal requirements are what, is, what are killing us. But what's interesting is in the last few months, we've seen that even people who do not need to hold th this requirement are doing so. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a person asking about audio levels. I, I need a thumbs up to make sure that everyone else can hear me just fine. My audio is good. Okay, awesome. Thank you. We'll keep going. Um, so the, the, the biggest answer is legal requirements for countries. Um, they, they expect that a, you know, that remember you, you hear a lot about funds and, you know, 40% bonds and 60% stocks. Well, government bonds make up a good portion of that, right? Corporate bonds are much riskier, so government bonds are seen to be low risk. So a certain percentage of the portfolio has to be low risk. But more than that, I think people are running toward government debt because they're afraid of the stock markets. They're afraid of markets. They're afraid of overinflation in real estate. They're afraid of overinflation in stock markets. So some of it simply is fear, right? So people believe, and it really is true, that governments will be the last ones to go down, right? Now, that may not be true in Italy or Spain, but certainly I think it's true in Germany and the, in the United States. So people are heading uh, for safety, and they're not really looking at the return. So uh, thank you for that comment, Kenneth. Yes, you are correct. Wow. Crime Inc. explained and exposed finally. It's crime on a global scale where trillions, not billions, but trillions of dollars are being stolen out of your pocket and mine. So, we talked about what has happened. Yes, it's stunning, but let's talk about why it happened. Much more important. 
Why is this happening? Well, it's all those powerful federal bankers, those five dudes that I had, those five people whose picture I had a while back, they're causing it. We've had 650 interest rate cuts, 650 of them in just the last eight years. That's an interest rate cut every three days. By cutting interest rates at such an insane level, they are forcing interest rates down. And it's causing this absurd environment where governments can actually borrow money at negative interest rates. Now keep in mind that while a lot of this happened in 2008 and 2009, notice it's spiking again. These rates have been highest they've been in a year in early 2016. So why are they cutting interest rates so often? What, what, what is making them do it? Well, that's because they're forcing yields down because they have two beliefs. When you force yield down, it pushes asset prices up and it pushes growth up. You notice I put in something known as a dogma alert here. Dogma is when you cling to a certain theory regardless of what logic suggests and regardless, regardless of what your available information suggests. It's something that you hold so dear that you don't care at all about what the evidence is looking at. So this is dogma, right? And we all know, I think everybody on this call knows that they have been very successful with interest rate cuts in pushing asset prices higher. The stock market is, has gone up from 6,500 points in 2009 to roughly 18, 19,000 uh, today. Uh, real estate markets have also gone up tremendously, right? Here's the second part though, the more important part, I've underlined it, and creates growth. Have they actually, during those 650 cuts, seen growth? And I'll come back to this graphic, by the way, because this is a standard way that central bankers put out a fire. They throw more gas at it. Well, let's see what all this gas actually did. Has it created growth? No. Global growth. A lot of our quantitative easing started here and here. Notice what's happening to growth. It's tanking. 2016 is supposed to be 2.7%, continuing to tank. This is what our young millennials call a WTF moment. You cut interest rates 650 times in the hope of growth. It doesn't happen, yet you continue cutting interest rates. It doesn't matter what is actually happening in the economy. You believe that it creates growth, even though it doesn't. And so you keep cutting interest rates forcing me to modify that important quote from the smartest man in history. Insanity is doing interest rate cuts over and over again and expecting different results. So here are some of the problems caused by interest rate cuts. And I think you're familiar with some, but I don't think you're familiar with all of these problems. First, I'm going to start with a quote. This is from Michael Hartnett, who is chief investment strategist at Bank of America Merrill Lynch. Central banks around the world have cut interest rates a combined 659 times since Lehman filed for bankruptcy in 2008, resulting in negative rates in many major economies, incited by the belief that every single interest rate in the world is heading to zero. The mountain of cash on the sidelines has induced irrational upside in government and corporate bonds. What does that mean? Governments have started to believe that they will never have to pay interest again. And when you have that belief, how well do you think you spend the money that you're borrowing? So here's a list of the problems caused by those interest rate cuts that I'm going to go through very quickly. Oh, before that, oh, John Williams. I forgot John Williams. He is the Federal Reserve President, right? So this is the sitting president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve President. And notice how cocky he is. He's very open. You are seeing extremely high asset valuations in real estate, commercial real estate, and the stock market is very strong relative to fundamentals. This is a natural result from low interest rates. That's one of the ways monetary policy affects the economy. Note that the, the robbers are not even saying we are not robbing. They continue to accept the fact that monetary policy creates asset bubbles. And they continue to accelerate that monetary policy. The gall of these people is stunning. So here's the top... 11 unintended consequences of high debt and rate cuts. Number one, of course, is real estate. So we've got high valuations for real estate in Sweden, Australia, Canada, UK, and US. If you think the US has a real estate bubble, please read about these other four countries, much worse off than, than we are. 
stock market, right? So you've got high stock market valuations in the U.S. We have not seen this in the Eurozone. It seems that the U.S. is, is definitely a little bit higher than it should be or a lot higher than it should be. Here's the third one. This is very good news for real estate investors. The United States has now reclaimed its place as the world's top safe haven. In the past, the safe havens were split between Japan, uh, a number of nations in, in Europe, and then the United States. Well, Europe seems to be in a really bad position right now. And Japan, remember that insane money printing exercise that in, they're involved in? Well, what that means is we are becoming a safe haven. Even Chinese money is flooding into the United States by the tens of billions of dollars. And a lot of it, a lot of it is going into our real estate. Returns. Unfortunately, after eight years of this orgy, safe investor yields are declining worldwide, forcing investors to buy more risky assets. In general, bad news, right? Because we can't put money in the bank and earn interest like we, we used to back in the 80s or 90s. But good news for real estate people. If you already own assets, please note that investors worldwide are jealous of you. They want what you have. And so more and more investors, even pension funds, are buying single family and multifamily investments, even value add or risky investments. The US dollar, it's growing stronger. It's been growing stronger for the last two years, and I think it's going to continue to grow stronger, and this has both negative and positive impacts. Growth, growth, economic growth appears to be slowing worldwide due to repeated interest cuts. Why? Well, people are not getting returns on their dollars. Wouldn't that make sense for them to then put money under the mattress instead of risking it and making a very small amount of money? Well, as a result, world growth is slowing. Irrational exuberance. Governments and corporations are behaving irrationally because money can be borrowed dirt cheap. They think they never have to pay it back because interest rates are negative. So who cares whether the money is actually being spent to do wise things? Retirement. Pension funds worldwide, including our own beloved Calsters, which is a uh, California teachers fund, are warning that they will be insolvent soon if the situation doesn't change quickly. Calsters keeps paying out at 7.5% and keeps making money at 5%. Guess what happens after they've been doing that for a while? They have no money. Gold. Investors are increasingly buying gold because they're afraid. Never, well not never, but almost never in history have stock prices real estate prices and gold all gone up at the same time. Those of you who've looked at gold markets for the last 30 years know this. If you have a bullish stock market and a bullish real estate market, gold tends to go down. It's a safe haven. Why is it going up at the same time? That's because even as markets go up, investors are becoming more and more fearful. And then inflation. The world, unfortunately, is not doing what it was supposed to be doing, which is we make 659 interest cuts. Well, obviously, it becomes cheaper to borrow, so it creates inflation. Standard Keynesian theory, economic theory. Well, none of that stuff has happened. The world is now moving closer to the dreaded D word, the word deflation. And then U.S. interest rates, of great interest to everyone on this call. With the world going negative, it's very, very difficult for the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates. Very good news for real estate investors. How can the Federal Reserve raise interest rates when the rest of the world appears to be continuously cutting interest rates? Keep in mind, we cannot allow the spread between our rates and their rates to increase too much because the dollar will become very strong and crush our manufacturing se sector. So even if the Fed wants to raise interest rates, it's very difficult for them to do so. So you learned a lot. You learned a lot of interesting things. Now let's talk about what this means for average Joe investors, right? So it's time to speculate. And really, this, is, this, chapter, this section is really all about speculation. So first, though, I'm going to stop, back up, and spend a few minutes on something known as Brexit. This was a very historic, very important event that happened on June 22nd. And what really is Brexit? Well, Britain seceded from the European Union. They were part of this 28-nation bloc. They had all these benefits. They had free trade. They had tariff benefits, they had freedom of movement, they said, sorry, we don't want any of that, we are moving away. So they, they, this was a referendum that happened on the 28th. Was it caused by debt? No. Was it caused by high interest rates? No. Then why are we talking about Brexit? Well, that's because Brexit has an impact on debt. Brexit has an impact on interest rates going forward. And these two things are so critical to our story 
that we had to bring, 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 bring Brexit in. So it's a reverse effect. Brexit was not caused by debt or interest rates, but Brexit is going to impact them. So we're talking about Brexit because it has an impact on mortgage rates. And here's what the Washington Post is saying. In the past month alone, 30-year fixed rate mortgages have hovered around 3.7%, nearly a three-year low. Britain's vote to leave the European Union is expected to drive rates even lower. Real estate investors, please note, lower rates coming. So here's a video. Unfortunately, videos don't work well over webinars, but I want those of you that really want to watch this awesome video to, to type in the following words. Write this down. How the UK's exit how the UK's exit benefits us US REITs, US real estate or US REITs, and type in the word CNBC after that, and the first link that should come up on Google should be a very nice three-minute video. I encourage all of you to watch it because it really talks about the benefits to real estate, US real estate, because of Brexit. So the bottom line on Brexit is it's having a very significant impact on both European Union debt and on worldwide interest rates. Now, most of this impact hasn't been felt yet. It is likely, very likely in my opinion, to be a catalyst for other EU countries to withdraw from the Union. This is going to lead to a possible breakup of the European Union. I hope that doesn't happen because that would be catastrophic for the whole world. It could also lead to further rate cuts in the EU and the UK. Now, this is much more likely than the breakup piece, and it's also much more imminent. Now keep your ears tuned for this. So if you start hearing other European countries announcing their own referendums, this is good news. It's good news for the U.S. economy and U.S. real estate. The world may go into recession because of this, by the way, so it may not be good news, but I don't think so. I think what really will happen is more money will come into the U.S. real estate market, and it's going to make it very, very, very hard for the poor Federal Reserve to raise our interest rates. So now, having talked about Brexit, I'm going to give you my opinion. You notice I've been very careful picking up graphs, charts, direct quotes from a whole bunch of different people. Now it's time for me to give you my opinion. What do I think? Once again, I'm not a forecaster. I'm not an analyst. I'm just somebody that spends a lot of time looking into my crystal ball. Here's my, what my crystal ball says. I think negative interest rates and skyrocketing uh, debt are a horrible, horrible mistake and will lead to to a global market crash at some point. I don't know when it happens. The point is my opinion really doesn't matter. What matters is what the reserve banks of the world think and they are set on their path, lowering interest rates and debasing their currencies, basically dropping their currencies. As a real estate investors, you should use the opportunity to make money at the expense of savers. I know this statement sounds horrible, but keep in mind, you're also a saver each day these interest rate cuts are affecting you. So there's nothing wrong in a capitalist society to make money at the expense of savers. The second part of my opinion is party hard. They never learn. This is my paradigm. The real estate party is not only likely to continue but could get even more boisterous just like the one in Canada or in Sweden or in the UK, all of these countries that are ahead of us in terms of their real estate bubbles as ever lower interest rates and the investors quest for yield drive real estate markets upward. This also means, unfortunately, that ever lower interest rates will accept real estate investors, investors like you, to accept either lower yield or higher risk, and most likely both. So that's my opinion. Now, I'd like to give you some scenarios, three possible scenarios about what 2016 and 2017 could look like. Now, we're already halfway through 2016, but I'll give you, you know, both years together. So I'll give you the next 18 months. Keep an eye on these scenarios. And again, these are my opinions, but a lot of people, you know, agree with me about these scenarios. So use these to help with your real estate decisions going forward. The first scenario is the Fed scenario. This is what the Federal Reserve believes in. Steady growth in 2016 and 17. The economy continues to grow, slow and steady. No major shocks to the world economy in 2016 or in 2017. The European Union is not in recession. The U.S. unemployment continues to recede, uh, reduce at an awesome 150,000 new jobs per month. And Brexit really has little impact. The Fed raises interest rates once this year, twice next year. Notice as we are going, this is becoming less and less credible. 
The stock market stomachs all of these rate increases and does not throw uh, taper tantrums, which it seems to have done. Inflation increases instead of decreasing, rising above 2%. So if this scenario happens, here's what I think happens to real estate. Oh, when wage pressures build, we start seeing employers paying more money because it's becoming more and more and more difficult to find employers. So let's see how this affects real estate. The outlook for real estate is sort of mixed. By the time the Fed raises interest rates another two or three times, well, cap rates should start to increase. Is that generally good for people that want to buy? No. Is it generally good for people that want to sell? No. But as a buyer, you'd probably benefit. At least cap rates are increasing, which means properties are getting a little bit cheaper. So mortgage rates are obviously going up because the Fed just raised interest rates two or three times in their scenario. There are potential challenges in this case for people selling properties in 2017 or later. So if you believe the scenario, the last page, well, you may want to sell now. Those with bridge mortgages are at risk, again, if you believe the scenario. Reducing unemployment, the Fed says jobs are going to, to, to keep happening, so there's reducing unemployment. And rising wage pressure should allow rents to increase faster than long-term norm, which, which is under 3%. This has happened so far, so I can't say that they're, they've been off by this in, in the past. This is really good news for those holding properties, because what that means is, regardless of what's really happening in terms of people's ability to pay, you should continue to see a rising rents, right? Again, this is the Fed scenario, so keep that in mind. A relatively strong U.S. economy continues to attract foreign capital for commercial real estate. This part, I do believe, because that's what's happening. Let's talk about the second scenario, the in-between scenario. Rocky, halting, slow growth in 2016 and 17. In this scenario, Italy or Japan's problems occupy the world's attention in 2017. Or, God forbid, China's economy has more severe problems. The U.S. economy continues to grow, doesn't tip into recession, but now it's being affected by all the stuff that's happening here. So it grows maybe by 1%. Unemployment gains slow, so you're not doing 150,000 150, jobs a month, you might be doing less than 100K, maybe 75,000 jobs a month. Well, as a result of that, Fed first raises interest rates because we are continuing to grow and they want to raise interest rates. But then in 2017, as everybody else here starts to slash rates, the United States also drops rates once or twice. Inflation and wage pressures remain dormant. Why? Because jobs are not growing. Remember, the, all these jobs, there's not a lot of them happening. So inflation and wage pressures are calm. There's not a lot of inflation. There's not a lot of wage pressures. There's no recession in the U.S., but Brexit in this scenario does hurt the growth of the European Union, which is mixed news for us, right? Because a lot of the money that was going into the London market is now coming into the United States. So what happens to real estate in the in-between scenario? Well, the outlook is again mixed, but it's very different from the first one. Well, with no net interest rate increases, maybe they increase it once and then they slash it again, and the U.S. safe haven status, cap rates and mortgage rates are steady. So the real estate market might stay where it is or just go up a little bit, right? Now, cap rates could go down further, which, is, which means that prices go up, right? Cap rates could easily go down further. Why? Because worldwide, all those investors that are looking for yield, all those investors who have legally been required to put up to 40% of their holdings in 0% bonds, they're going to be hunting for yield. They know the United States is a safe haven. They know our real estate is going up. They know our situation is not as bad as Europe or Japan. So guess where they bring their real estate money? Keep. Sellers can take their time selling in this scenario. And buyers have plenty of justification to keep paying the current somewhat inflated rates. There's no wage pressures, right? In this environment, there's not a lot of jobs being created. No wage pressures, no inflation pressures. Rent increases slow down. So notice in this scenario, rent increases are slowing down and moving closer to long-term norms. So maybe 3%, 2.5% rent increases. And keep in mind, this particular scenario is the one that I believe in. So when I buy an apartment complex, I'm, I'm focused on this. I'm focused on making sure that my rent increases are not absurd, that I can actually hit my numbers. Now, it's not good for those currently holding assets, the fact that rent increases are slowing down. But keep in mind, you know, if you're holding real estate, you've had three phenomenal years. So their investments are really still very good ones. 
Now, those who are making purchases in the second half of 2016 or in 2017 will have trouble hitting high rent projections. I'm not saying it's a bad time to buy real estate because if you look at the top part, cap rates could easily go down further. So not a bad time to buy real estate. But keep in mind that if you think that you'll continue to hit high rent projections, those who believe in those scenario, this scenario, like me, please agree with you. Here's the third scenario, one that everyone's fearful of, and currently the IMF gives it a 30% chance of happening in 2017. I give it a somewhat higher than 30% chance. There are problems in either European Union or China or Japan. They push the world economy and the U.S. into recession. Immediately, interest rates go negative worldwide, including the United States. So now in, we are in a worldwide negative interest rate environment. Unemployment sharply increases in the U.S. and abroad. Inflation falls, wages fall, deflation becomes much more likely. U.S. deficit rises quickly to over a trillion dollars a year, but our stupid politicians engage in large-scale deficit spending. So they, they basically spend money they don't have. They also start to do what is known as quantitative easing or money printing. So here's what happens to real estate. Well, the outlook is very negative uh, for real estate in short term, and then potentially very positive or even spectacularly positive in the mid and long term. So think about that. Negative in the short term, potentially very positive in mid and long term. Short term, unemployment is going up, right? Well, then rents will go down. When unemployment goes up, rents go down, and will definitely plateau. If they don't go down, they're definitely going to plateau. They're not going to go up anymore, right? So if you're buying on the basis of high rent growth, well, you're going to miss all your projections. Single family home pricing will decline, again, as unemployment spikes. Foreclosures will spike. So there'll be some buying opportunities for those of you that are sitting on their money at that point. Vacancy rates will rise with declining net operating income and increasing del delinquency. Cap rates will go up. Though, here's the good news. The mortgage rates are now lower, right? Because we're going negative on, on interest rates. Well, that's gonna prevent a big upward move in cap rates. So we, we don't, I don't see, and a whole bunch of people don't see cap rates going insanely high. They might go up a little bit. Now, flips will be risky. Why? Because if you're flipping in an environment where unemployment is increasing, you don't know if the, the rates go up or the rates go down. So in this in scenario, if the U.S. and the world enters recession, flips become very risky. Here's the good news, though. I believe this stuff. Those who survive a very painful, very testing 12 to 12 month period, 12 to 24 month period, should then benefit greatly because the reserve bankers of the world, and I've shown this to you in section two, they only know one, to, one thing to do. When the economy goes into recession or appears to be going into recession, they do interest cuts. They do quantitative easing. They do worldwide deficit spending. So guess what they're going to do? They're going to do even more of this, and it's going to be an even larger cycle. And guess what happens when they do that? It creates asset bubbles in hard assets, and it creates buying opportunities as well. So there's going to be price inflation. But before there's price inflation, there's going to be some deflation. So think about 2009, a big dip followed by a very rapid, much quicker than 2009 increase in prices. Why? Because the bankers are getting much more efficient at cutting interest rates and doing quantitative easing. All the politicians are well trained. You make a phone call to Capitol Hill and say, hey, I'm going to do another trillion dollars and nobody complains. Where in 2008, they were saying, what the hell is quantitative easing? First explain it to us before we give you approval. Now everybody's trained. So now the cycle of real estate going downwards, of stock markets going downward, might be much shorter, right? So it could be 12 to 24 months instead of being three to four years. So that, that was our scenario three. So think about which of these scenarios you, you really like and, and make your decisions. I'll send you this PowerPoint so you can look at all this stuff again. And any of you that feels like they want to discuss this with me, feel free to do so. I'm happy to meet with you guys. I'm happy to see you here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so I have, a, I have a question. Let me take uh, this question from Felicia. I just want to buy a house in the city that I live in. It's Chino and the rent for nice places to live, live here is getting too high. Can I realistically afford to buy a house? I'm a single woman, 48k net. A yearly salary is 78k gross and I don't have a lot of money to put down. My opinion, Felicia? No, you don't. Um, 
Adrian, thank you for your compliments. Um, I, we're going get to get to the question session here because there's almost 100 of you logged on here. I'm sure I'll get some very interesting questions. But before I take questions, I've got to thank a few people. Bob Peterson's awesome mentor project, which is at thementorproject.net. A number of you signed up through them. Also, Reg uh, Garabedian, who's a coach, real estate attorney, and property manager here in the Bay Area. He's associated with the mentor project. Uh, and our sources, Malden Economics, Real Vision, McKinsey, and Bloomberg and also CNBC. Also, before I open this up for questions, it's time for my 30 seconds of shameless self-promotion. So for multifamily investment opportunities with a team that is making decisions with a strong understanding of what we believe is the upcoming upheaval in the markets, and we're refining a set of investing principles to mitigate some of these risks. And for multifamily, these principles are so simple that I could actually explain it to the, you in, in five minutes. I won't go into that. But basically, what we're doing is we're, we're creating certain principles and saying, this is how we believe the market is going to react. So when we invest, we have to make sure that we mitigate or try to mitigate some of these risks. If you're looking to invest with a team like that, please note this down. Please visit our website, financial dash attunement, A-T-T-U-N-E-M-E-N-T, -E -E and fill out our investor form. We have a property, we have properties coming up all the time, and we have one coming out as, as early as two weeks from now. Or just send me an email. A lot of people disagree with what I've put forth in this presentation. That's fine with me. Send me an email, and I'd be happy to discuss it with, with you. You're also happy, you, you can also send me an email and ask to meet, meet with me. I really enjoy doing that, especially it's about the stuff that's in this presentation. Here's my email address, neilbawa at gmail.com. Uh, once again, if you're interested in properties, please fill out the investor form on our website. Now, I'll take questions. Questions, questions. Let me see if I, I think I lost my cursor, cursor here. All right, so a question from Yama. Um, would you buy multi-units at the present if cap rates are good, such as 7% or higher? Hell yeah, absolutely. If you can buy multi-units at 7% percent cap rates in the Bay Area? Uh, um, the, the answer is, Yama, no such things exist. If you can buy, um, and, and Yama is clarifying saying four units, I mean, the answer is, if you can buy 7% uh, or higher in the San Francisco Bay Area, count me in. I'll invest in them. I'm not sure they actually exist, but if they're around, I'd love to look at them. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, just so you know, I haven't invested in the San Francisco Bay Area at all in the last year, uh, in the last um, cycle, um, simply because I find that valuations are very high right now. But if you have CAP 7 properties, let's talk. Um, Dana's question, what about multifamily mobile home parks in Santa Cruz with CAP rates of 8%? So I'm going to give you a very philosophical answer, Dana. If you're looking to hold for a few years, don't hold mobile parks. Mobile parks suffer from very high delinquency when the economy has a downturn. If you're looking to hold them for 10 years and you have enough operational reserves to go through that mobile home hit that happens when the economy turns down, it's a wonderful idea. So I support mobile homes as a long-term investment. I do not support them as a next three-year investment because you probably miss your, your, your uh, projections. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for your kind comments. Um, what about investing in hotels? Well, that's a very generic question, TK. The answer is hotels benefit from the same asset bubble effect that real estate and stocks are benefiting from. If you believe either the, um, if you believe any three of those scenarios and you can invest in hotels where, where people like us are holding su sufficient operational reserves to get through the bad times, it's not a bad idea. The only comment that I have is it is well known that the hotel sector was the last real estate sector to, to recover from the last recession. So understand that the pain for hospitality lasts much longer than it does for multifamily. That's because people need to live in homes all the time. They don't need to live, live in hotels all the time. Linda says, what do you think of turnkey properties out of states, uh, out of your state? Uh, is it a worthwhile investment? The answer is yes. It really depends on the opportunity, Linda. They're, they're worthwhile. I am very heavily invested in Chicago. I have eight properties, 22 units there, and it's been worthwhile. So the answer is it's, you, you need to make sure that it's a safe investment, but as long as it is, then it definitely makes sense. 
Um, so more questions. Atma, uh, what strategy should I use in my area where multi-unit prices are very high but rent is not so high? Atma, don't buy. Buy in areas, <laughs> many other areas, where you have the reverse happening. The prices are not very high but rents are very high. There's plenty of such areas. Uh, call me and I'll give you a list. Don't buy in your area. Um, um, to be honest, I give people very frank and blunt answers, so um, you know, I, I hope that it doesn't you know, rub anybody the wrong way. Um, Isosa, thank you for your, your kind comments. Uh, Nick, uh, what are your expectations in the next month in terms of interest rates of prices? The answer is I expect interest rates to briefly go up. The market the, you know, absorbed the Brexit impact, uh, and, and so we, we saw a decline in interest rates, and now they're beginning to go up. I think they'll go up for a while before it becomes obvious to markets that Brexit has a long-term impact that it will impact the European Union. At some point, they'll start cutting interest rates, and so they'll come back down. In the next six months, six months from now, I think interest rates will be lower than they are. Um, question from Ernest. Um, I, Ernest, I need, I need your full question. Anybody else? Any more questions? I'm, I'm really enjoying the, the question bombardment, so keep them coming. We've got five minutes left. Actually, we've got about two minutes left. What countries would you invest in outside the United States? Royce, I have to give you a very blunt answer. Right now, this is the safest place in the world, and there's very few other safe places. Hopefully that answers your questions. Kenneth Parr, I logged in 10 to 15 minutes late. Will there be a replay link? No, I'm going to send you a PowerPoint. Respond back to that email and I'll send you a replay link. Uh, what are your thoughts of purchasing land in Bay Area, California? If you can find it at reasonable rates, yes. But Dana, keep in mind that two out of the three scenarios here, um, it would be very difficult for you to get a bridge loan. So in general, I advise against bridge loans. And it's very difficult to do land, but, you know, land development uh, without a bridge loan. So it, generally at this point, anybody who comes to me and says, let's do a development project in the Bay Area, I say no. What do you think of Oakland multi-units with the influx of people from SF moving to Oakland increasing rents? Yama, you've already missed that boat. Oakland was the best place in the United States for rents for the last two years. It is now ranked number one in the United States for a, a slowdown in rent growth. So its rent growth is not negative, but it's slowing down faster than all other 59 markets in the U.S. You missed that boat. John Mejia, I'd love to meet with you, John. Absolutely. Um, Francisco, Francisco, what is your opinion on investing in assisted living facilities? I think it's an awesome idea. Assisted, assisted living is a trend. The baby boomers are getting older. They need these places to live in. I think it's a great idea. Uh, Yama says, would you buy there? I don't know what that means by, by, by there, Yama. Nick says, houses must is multifamily. Which do you favor next 12 months? Oh, very heavily multifamily. Uh, in an environment where I'm nervous about the financial conditions of the world, multis do better than houses because in a recession, people, don't, people who own houses leave them to go to multis. Have you ever heard of people in a recession leaving multifamily and going to buy homes? Doesn't happen. Uh, let's see, more questions. Um, Great presentation. Would you invest in high cap, low cap, uh, or income areas, or high cap income areas? The answer is usually somewhere in the middle. I don't like high cap income areas, low income areas. I don't like them because they have a lot of delinquency. And I absolutely hate high, low cap, high income areas like the San Francisco Bay Area. These, these areas make no sense whatsoever. I have no idea why people continue to buy two cap, three cap properties. But I also have no idea why people buy 15 cap properties. That's just a recipe for disaster. It, it's somewhere in the middle. The Goldilocks zone, in my opinion, is 7 to 10, and anything beyond 10 is, is very risky. Um, what do you think of Memphis market? Do you like it? Any interest in a you know, micro position? Well, we can talk about it, Ernest. Um, I don't have an issue with Memphis. I think it's a decent market, but there are areas of Memphis that are really bad and some that are really good. So the answer is it depends. Um, more questions. Dominique, still bullish on Dallas. The short answer is yes and no. 
I am not bullish on Dallas in the next two or three years, and and I continue to to uh, to make offers in Dallas, but I keep getting turned down because I'm offering too little money. In the next ten years, Dallas is my number one pick for the next ten years. There is no economy like Dallas for ten year on a, in a ten year time frame. Any plans to be in Los Angeles soon, Nick? I come to LA all the time. My in-laws live there. Just drop me an email. Jason, um, oh, I love this question. Let me take this question. I, 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 this, this is a great one from Jason Jennings. Uh, do you see the precious metal sector continuing to rise in, sp in spite of the relative bull stock market? I hold a significant amount of my assets in gold. I suggest that everybody else do it. But for God's sake, Jason, don't try to figure out what happens to precious metal in the short term. But in the long term, keep in mind, the world just added $57 trillion of debt. What do you think happens to gold prices when people add $57 trillion in debt? All right, how about multifamily near colleges for student houses? Is this a good opportunity? In my opinion, of all the things suggested in this webinar, this is the best opportunity. Multifamily for student housing is a very difficult thing to get right. A whole bunch of people get it wrong. If you know how to do it, involve me. I think it's a great opportunity. What's your opinion on Phoenix uh, area for multifamily units? I'm positive on it. Um, what are your top three emerging markets? I am so sorry, Sosa. That particular answer I cannot give you. Um, would you be interested in buying BNC multi-units in the southeast or Midwest? Absolutely. Kevin Breesdale, please drop me an email. I would be interested. I'm refinancing my duplex. Better to do cash out and buy another property or lower my interest rate. For God's sake, TK, don't refinance. Please cash out. You'll never see a better time. So we're a few, you know four minutes beyond. I know that there there are people that that want to leave. If you're if you're interested, I'll I'll keep going for the next five minutes or so because I'm enjoying what people are asking. John May here. How about the markets of Columbus, Ohio, and Indiana for multis? I think both are great markets. I think both are also risky markets. Keep in mind that both of those markets, certain areas have high delinquency. In my opinion, Indianapolis is better than Columbus. Columbus was better a few years ago. Again, know those areas well. In the Rust Belt, really know your areas well. In the Bay Area, if you make a mistake, you don't get killed. In Columbus or Indianapolis, you get nailed if you make a mistake. TK says, is it harder to get insurance for student multi-house properties? Uh, no, you just have to go to the right people. Um, Isosa, what about Northeast Ohio? Um, I don't know enough. I hear good things about Benton. All right, the bombardment finally stopped. Wow, and nobody's leaving. That's amazing. We've been going for six minutes over our time. I'll wait for another 30 seconds. If not, we'll bring this event to a close. Once again, I love interacting with people. You can tell that I'm passionate about this. Um, so hopefully we don't stop the interaction here. Reach out to me if you have questions. I'll be happy to answer them. If you want to meet me, I'll be happy to, to um, uh, answer. Uh, Yevgeny says, did you mention not to refinance? No, um, that was a, a particular case that was mentioned by someone else, a question. So I, I don't think that refinancing is relevant to your situation. Um, so more questions. Oh, five or six of them came in. Can I get some advice about university housing? Sure, reach out to me. I mean, in general, I think it's a great market. Obviously, individual deals are going to vary from really bad to really awesome. What are your feelings about LA County? Well, let me put it this way. Um, be careful. Be very, very careful. Haven't you looked east? There's a lot of good markets. Just look a little further east from LA County. What about transitional housing programs, the renting out to them? I don't, I hear a lot about transitional housing programs. I don't know enough. Um, Regina, I'll be happy if you drop me an email, I'll send you a recording of the presentation. Um, I can't thank all of those people that are thanking me, but uh, thank you so much. I love doing this. I'm passionate about real estate, and um, I, um, I hope that we get to do this again. Thank you so much, and you guys have a wonderful evening. Goodbye now.